Uh, I think if we design with an eye toward sort of improving ourselves rather than making ourselves obsolete, we will make for a much better economy, a much better future, and better people. Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. When we think about the future of work, there's plenty of anxiety about automation. As in, what happens if and when the robots take over? Will we all lose our jobs? A recent study predicts thousands of local jobs could just vanish to automation. And we've seen it, you know, kiosks at restaurants, robots serving food. Yeah, check into a hotel. You can thousands of banking jobs are on track to disappear from the U.S. economy. They are not being axed because of policy, but because of technology for decades. And my friends in California are piloting self-driving trucks. What is that going to mean for the three and a half million truckers or the seven million Americans? Who but automation could be just the starting point. What happens when we add artificial intelligence, or AI, into the equation? Today we're looking at how AI might improve the lives of workers, or make them obsolete. And that story starts with the history of automation. I think when people talk about AI today, the idea of AI does a lot of the same discursive or rhetorical work that automation did in the 1950s and the 1960s which is it's a vague technology. It's not exactly clear what machines people are usually talking about or what processes there are. Jason Reznikoff is a history and technology lecturer at Columbia University. He also wrote the book, Labor's End, How the Promise of Automation Degraded Work. And at the same time, it has a sense of it being the future and being somehow decisive, although precisely how is not clear, although it's definitely premised on the end of human labor. Reznikoff says that when the digital computer was introduced to the office in the 1950s and 60s, the predominant narrative was that automation would replace humans. But to understand why that concern took hold, we need to go back a little further. Reznikoff says that after the Great Depression, a lot of Americans were disillusioned. But the victory in World War II changed that outlook. America prepares. All America alters its pattern of life and work to meet the demand for protection. Industry is a double step to supply the sinews of safety. The armaments of war that an embattled world must have... If there was a, a sort of a rejuvenated faith, especially in the United States of America, in both technology as an idea. This is when the word technology, in fact, becomes commonly used. It was a, a pretty rare word before that. And a wave of new innovations captured the imagination of Americans. The list of sort of um, technological miracles that came out of that war, I mean, miracle in quotation marks, right? But uh, remarkable achievements were astounding to people. The electronic digital computer, jet engines, uh, the atomic bomb. And these are just like a few and all one in quick succession. So this led, especially in the United States, to a kind of a real heady faith in the, uh, in the idea of technology, that we were entering a new world where basically the limits to American power and to industrial power were gone. Automation on a large scale in the U.S. took off after the war. Manufacturers, like the auto industry, looked for ways to save labor costs and make their assembly process more efficient. In the mid-1940s, you know, the Ford Motor Company, as well as all the major manufacturers in the automobile industry, wanted to escape the labor movement. So they sort of attached their anti-union philosophy to technology. And they said, all right, you know, it's not that we want to get rid of unions, is that technologically speaking, history is making work obsolete. We no longer need the workers themselves. If we want to be in tune with progress, we have to be willing to say goodbye to the semi-skilled industrial worker who just recently gained power on the shop floor. Surprisingly, some labor unions were actually in favor of this because they imagined a version of ownership for workers who would be served rather than replaced by machines. For example, Reznikoff says the United Auto Workers were in favor of automation because they thought it would help get workers yearly salaries instead of hourly wages. No one needs to work at all, right? No one needs to work for anybody. We'll just all live off of the second nature we've built, and the machines will work for us. 
that's a different idea of the relationship between work and freedom. So one idea, which is a little bit more common in the American political landscape beginning in the 18th century, is that a free person worked for themselves. Automation discourse has a different idea, which you can call more Aristotelian, to go back to the Greeks, you know, which is a, a free person has other people working for them. Reznikov says automation made it seem possible that we could essentially have mechanical servants working for us. And some people did say this is a problem, it's going to be the end of the working class. But then you had other people like Daniel Bell in his work, uh, Work in Its Discontents, it's his book, he says, we're going to no longer have a proletariat, but everyone will become a member of the salariat. Everyone's going to be a middle-class white-collar worker. So we're going to get rid of these bad physical jobs, and everyone's going to have a brain job. Everyone's going to be middle-class. And thus, automation was born. The actual term was coined by the Ford Motor Company, but the guy who helped make it go mainstream was John Diebold. Diebold was a graduate student at Harvard. Back in the 1950s, he saw the potential of the computer to transform office work. And in the early 1950s, it wasn't at all clear how you could use an electronic digital computer to make any money because they were extremely expensive, they were huge, and they just crunched numbers, right? And so for most people looking at computers, they're saying, well, if I want to send a rocket to Mars or if I want to like create you know, explosive lenses to set off an atomic bomb, I might use this machine, but what, what else would I use it for? And for John Diebold, he was entirely premised on the idea that the electronic computer's value lay in its ability to replace human labor. That's what would make computers valuable to businessmen. And they would do it by handling information, right? Because in the 1950s, there were more and more clerical workers entering the American office. So the computer was going to answer this problem by doing their work more efficiently. The idea didn't go quite as planned. The kind of computer wasn't one you could slip into a bag and take to your local coffee shop. Computers at the time were massive, taking up entire rooms, and they used punch cards to input data. Running these computers took more work, not less. These big mainframe batch processors, they actually require a great deal of labor. It, ta it takes a great deal of labor to produce a punch card in order to enter in the information. So if you want to actually take advantage of the speed of the digital computer, you have to get higher, way more people to start, you know, turning forms and documents into a machine-readable language. Well into the 1980s, you have people complaining that when the, the more computers that they bring in, it, they do a lot of work, but they only sped up one portion of office work. So they actually had to bring in more human labor to compensate. So you get this very ironic situation, very strange. In the 50s, the idea that machines could take the place of not only our bodies, but also our brains became more widespread. Mathematician and computer scientist Alan Turing invented what he called the imitation game, also known as the Turing test. He posed the question, can machines think? His test asked a subject to guess whether a conversation via text was with a computer or a machine. If the subject couldn't tell the difference, the machine won the game. That had implications for workers. If machines actually had some form of consciousness, that would make getting rid of human labor a more plausible reality. And this is also the time you have someone like Isaac Asimov. He comes up with his three laws of robotics. And, uh, and the three laws are you know, a robot always has to obey orders, a robot must, can't hurt another person, and a robot has to protect itself. And if you think about it, these are the three ideal laws for a, an enslaved person. And so you do have people beginning to say, like, you know, there will be like a robot uprising. And it's growing immediately out of the tensions of industrial society and, you know, the threat of class conflict. But it turned out that with robots, reality looked far different than theory. Machines still needed human assistance to work and to fix them when they broke down. Some machines can definitely do things that human beings maybe don't want to do or shouldn't do in, in certain environments, but they can go either way. So like the uh, continuous miner was introduced into coal mining in the late 40s, and it's actually still a machine that's, that's used. The continuous coal miner was a low-slung cart on wheels with mechanical teeth in front. The teeth spun and quickly extracted, then spit the coal out behind the machine. One thing it didn't do, make less work for the human coal miners. But what workers would describe with this machine was brought in. It's not that they had to work less, but of course they had to work more. So, uh, and that's because it was being run very quickly. And in fact, workers would complain that, you know, as this thing is spitting out coal behind them, the coal would pile up and they couldn't get out because they couldn't clear the coal fast enough. So more people didn't have to go into coal mines If the challenges of automation aren't new, 
How should we think about the next chapter? Coming up, what's next for AI in the workplace? And what will it mean for your job? Welcome back to the Best New Ideas in Money. Before the break, we traveled through the history of automation in the workplace. But what does our future look like? One story that's recently gotten a lot of attention is the engineer at Google who claimed that the AI he works with is sentient. This is a fascinating story we have for you of a senior Google engineer who says one of the company's artificial intelligence systems has become a sentient being and was thinking and reasoning. Like Last Friday, Google said it dismissed the engineer, saying he violated company policies and that his claims were determined to be wholly unfounded. In order to unpack what happened, we first need to get into what exactly a neural network is and how the technology works. This form of AI is called a large language model, essentially what AI researchers call a neural network. It works something like this. You teach a mathematical system how to do new things by feeding it lots and lots of data things like photos or thousands of hours of spoken words. Then the system learns how to identify patterns. You could feed thousands of uh, pictures of a cat into a neural network. It identifies the patterns that define what a cat looks like. In that way, it learns to identify a cat. That's Cade Metz. He covered the Google story for the New York Times. These large language models are that same type of mathematical system on an enormous scale, where it's analyzing literally for months, digital books, Wikipedia articles, all sorts of other text posted to the internet. It thrives on volume, right? It, it looks at as, as much data as it can and looks for those patterns that are uh, inherent to the way you and I piece words together. But Metz says that although this type of AI, the large language model, is capable of reproducing patterns, that's all it can do. You know, Siri can recognize the words that you say, but is that intelligence? No, it's just pattern recognition. A facial recognition system can recognize your face, but is, is that intelligence? It's not. It's a specific task. So in the case of that Google AI, Met says that although it looks impressive, some of it is just wanting to believe. He says it's human nature to see humanness in this system. When you see this little piece of remarkable behavior, you extrapolate. On top of that, there are so many people working in the AI field who are in the field because they want to build a truly intelligent machine. And they really believe this is what they are doing and they hang out with other people with the same beliefs. And these beliefs kind of reinforce themselves. And you get this subsection of the AI community, which is intent on building what they call artificial general intelligence, a system that can do anything the human brain can do. They really believe this is what they're doing. Met says another factor making us believe in the advancement of AI is that it's the message we're constantly getting. Very large companies which are building these technologies, they give us the impression that those sorts of technologies are almost here on the way for a couple of reasons. It's a way of attracting the money they need to build their technology. It's a way of attracting the talent they need. But a side effect is that it really misleads the public. Met says many AI technologies we read about are not developed enough yet to work in the real world. And the ones that are, they often need humans to run them. These large language models today, one of the things they do is they help computer programmers. It allows them to automatically generate some code that they can then incorporate into their larger programs. It's not a system uh, that is going to write all computer programs and somehow put all those people out of their jobs. It's not like that at all. However we choose to use it, AI is here and will likely expand into more areas of our lives. So AI, no matter how you dice it, has been um, growing. In a sense, it's been kind of moving inexorably in this direction. 
in terms of influencing the workplace and how workers and consumers behave for years now. That's John Swartz, a tech reporter for MarketWatch. He says that all kinds of workplaces, from the Pentagon to John Deere to small business warehouses to hospitals, are all using AI already. I think of the agriculture field, which is pretty traditional, but it's starting to move more towards autonomous farming, drones, use of data, more so than ever before. It's going to be more wrenching in an industry like that or a car industry than it would be in the you know Silicon Valley companies. Swartz says AI can be part of all kinds of work roles. And while it might be hard to imagine it taking over as the CEO of a company, what about a supervisor? There's a new company called Robust AI, and they unveiled this mobile robot called Carter, which is designed to work in warehouse facilities. And the idea is this mobile warehouse robot has the ability to read human body language to tell what workers around it are doing. So in a sense, the robot is working in tandem with the workers to see their habits and in, in kind of interpreting how they might work more efficiently. But AI is not only being used to maximize worker efficiency. Healthcare is one industry which is expected to gain some real benefits using AI for diagnostic purposes. Some AI technology can learn to read retina scans in diabetic patients and diagnose problems with 99% accuracy. Where you have these AI assisted healthcare technicians kind of interpreting or, or looking at your patterns of your health data and then suggesting to you without you physically being in an office, you know, kind of tracking certain vitals and offering feedback on how you might take better care of yourself. Another innovation is the use of AI in journalism. I know the AP looked into it. They, they tested this whole idea of um, AI-generated stories from sporting events or from earnings reports. I understand it's probably easily doable. You're probably going to still need somebody to edit it. But in a sense, it kind of eliminates a lot of, a lot of jobs, which creates tension among employees because, you know, as employees are in a workplace and they, some of the things they're comfortable with are taken away from them, they have to reinvent themselves. So there's a bit of frustration or, or fear or anxiety about the future. Of course, one of the biggest fears around AI is that it will replace human workers. Yeah, the ethical questions have always been that AI is going to come and replace you. You go into a retail place and the people who used to help you before, even like a grocery store, their jobs are gone. I mean, you're basically checking yourself out, right, through a, a smart register. You see fewer people working in the retail outlets, especially consumer-related retail outlets. Their, their jobs, in a sense, have been eliminated. A recent report by the World Economic Forum estimates AI will replace some 85 million jobs by 2025. But on the bright side, they say, will help create 97 million new jobs in the way of things like machine learning engineers, robotics engineers, data scientists, highly skilled jobs. And if you, you know, read between the lines, that means that people with the less skilled jobs aren't as likely to benefit, which means that the people who used to do those jobs are going to have to figure out how they're going to adapt in this new work environment. And that's something that scares me to a certain extent. I don't know what this is going to do to places like uh, small businesses or the service industry in particular. It creates a level of convenience, but it also completely disrupts the workforce. Alex Pong is from Four Day Week Global, an organization that works on redesigning work life. He's a little more optimistic about the job replacement fears. He says that while some businesses might choose to use AI to decrease headcount, many companies have the opportunity to make work life better for their employees. Job reduction as a consequence of automation is more kind of business strategy, then it doesn't have to be this way, right? With any particular technology, there are choices that you can make about whether you will deploy them to, you know, to eliminate jobs or to make work better. In Pong's opinion, robots don't take your job. As we mentioned before, since the earliest days of automation, these advances in technology tend to result in more jobs, not fewer. 
If you look at some fields that have been highly automated, you find that the number of people working in them has actually gone up as automation or sort of has progressed, not down. So in the sciences, for example, there are you know, tools now that allow for you know, chemical analyses or for you know, analyzing DNA sequences that are literally billions of times faster than what scientists had, let's say, a generation ago. But the number of scientists has not gone down as these tools have been introduced, nor has the amount or arguably the quality of, of science declined. So why is that? When workers themselves have the power to decide how automation is deployed within the workplace, the result is not fewer jobs and robots taking over, or the result is higher quality work and often an expansion of these of fields or sort of an increase in the number of people working in them. Pong says instead of fearing automation and AI, we should look at it as something that could make our lives better. One of the amazing capacities that we all have as humans is to use technologies to extend our physical abilities, to extend our cognitive capacity. You know, humans, for as long as there have been humans, have been incredibly good at building tools and using them to extend our cognitive and physical abilities. In the future, the most humane technologies could be ones that, even as they possess greater and greater capacities to do things somewhat like what humans do, will be ones that allow us to offload tasks that maybe we're not so good at and thereby allow us to continue to do the things that we love most, to do the things that make us most human. Thanks for listening to the best new ideas in money. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Jason Reznikoff, Cade Metz, Alex Pong, and Jonathan Swartz. To learn more about artificial intelligence, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from MarketWatch produced by Best Case Studios. Suzanne Myers is our producer. Our associate producer is Hannah Leibowitz Lockhart. The executive producer for Best Case Studios is Adam Pincus. For MarketWatch, Melissa Haggerty is the executive producer, and the producers are Meta Lutzhoft and Katie Ferguson. Jeremy Binks is our news editor, and Tim Roston is the executive editor for MarketWatch. Megan Oftermat mixed this episode. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.